Last year, Obsidian released Pentiment, whose director was one of the minds behind big RPGs like Fallout New Vegas and Pillars of Eternity. But Pentiment is a side-scrolling adventure game with some light RPG elements, and it's not quite like anything I've ever played before, mainly because of its rich historical setting and distinctive art style. Thanks to huge successes like Red Dead Redemption, Assassin's Creed, Age of Empires, and the 10 billion World War II shooters that are out there, it's no secret that games with historical settings can match or surpass even the most creative fictional worlds and how interesting and immersive they are. But the market is still mostly dominated by fantasy and sci-fi titles when it comes to lore-heavy, story-driven games. But Pentiment doesn't follow this trend, and it distinguishes itself from the other games I just mentioned in a few ways that really puts extra emphasis on its historical setting. The entire game revolves around dialogue, and dialogue choices Choices, with the only exceptions being a few short mini-games, and there are tons of references to people, places, things, and issues that are relevant to the time period the characters live in. No, you're not running around sneezing all the time, that's just how some people talk back then. The time period and geography depicted aren't typically as well known as other more popular periods of history like say the French Revolution or Ancient Egypt. Pentiment takes place during the early 16th century in Upper Bavaria, a southern region of modern-day Germany. It's a time of major upheaval and change, brought on by important events like the Protestant Reformation and the German Peasants' War. The game also has an incredible, colorful art style that makes it look like it's actually playing out in an old-fashioned storybook. Pentiment was designed by a small team of just 13 people with a modest budget, and it's been described as a passion project due to the director Josh Sawyer's desire to make a historical game and his academic background in history. If you have absolutely no interest in history, or you don't want to play a game that focuses solely on its narrative and requires a lot of reading, then it's true that you might not like Pentiment. But you should keep in mind that it's not like reading some dusty old history encyclopedia. Like any good story, there are no big info dumps that bore you to death with line after line of exposition. Instead, a lot of the details you need to know about the setting are weaved into the plot so that you can learn about them gradually through the context of the story. And when a term or name comes up that isn't explained through dialogue, a quick tap of a button brings up an in-game glossary that gives you a short definition. This can also help remind you of who the game's many characters are, so it's pretty simple and easy to get a grasp of what's going on around you. At the start of the game, you take control of Andreas Mahler in the year 1518. He's a journeyman artist working in a scriptorium within a Benedictine monastery. Scriptoriums were rooms used for copying and illustrating manuscripts, and during Andreas' time they were close to extinction. One of the major reasons for this is the rise of the printing press. The closest modern day comparison that I can think of is sort of like someone working for a print newspaper or magazine after the rise of the internet. When Andreas isn't busy working or seducing nuns, he stays in the nearby fictional town Tassing. Tassing and the monastery Kirisu Abbey are where the entire game takes place. It's a small game world, but it's densely packed with a bunch of characters who have their own unique problems, desires, personalities, and sometimes secrets. Pentiment is split up into three acts, which takes place over three generations, so you'll witness changes to the town, abbey, and people over time, some of which are direct consequences of choices you make. There are also changes as time progresses over the course of a few days within each act, so there's enough variety in what you encounter to help prevent the setting from feeling too stale, despite its small size. The story starts with an important baron paying a visit to the abbey to check up on a manuscript he commissioned, but shortly after he arrives he's found murdered, and Andreas's friend, an elderly monk named Brother Piero, gets blamed for the crime. Andreas never claims to be the smartest man alive, but he's pretty sure that the frail, docile old monk didn't suddenly turn into the Hulk and overpower the younger, healthier baron. So Andreas sets out to vindicate Piero by trying to discover who the real killer is. The game becomes a proper murder mystery where you'll have to question suspects, pursue leads, and you'll learn a lot about the setting and its inhabitants along the way. Pentiment has no voice acting, and all of the game's dialogue appears in text bubbles. Since there's a ton of it, you spend a lot of time staring at text, so to make this more engaging, a lot of effort was put into the game's fonts to make them appear stylish and appropriate for the depicted time period. And they're implemented in some really cool ways that even gives you some insight about the speaker, like how they correspond to a speaker's education level or profession. Claws, the town printer's dialogue, has a typeface resembling letters from a printing press, and peasants use a relatively plain, handwritten font, while some clergy members use a fancier script. There are several different fonts like this, all of which have some meaning behind them. To make things a little more interesting, the fonts represent how Andreas perceives a character, so sometimes it'll change in the middle of a conversation if he learns something new about whoever he's talking to. They're animated too, and have sound effects. Letters appear gradually on screen as if someone was actually writing them down, accompanied by faint scratching sounds of a quill. You'll also see text shake to put emphasis on loud noises, and there are even spelling errors that get quickly corrected to add some more authenticity. 
This kind of attention to an aspect that's so prevalent throughout the game was a great idea by the developers. It never seemed obnoxious or out of place, and it gives the game this kind of elegant feel that makes conversations more enjoyable. The only problem I had was that the animated text appeared on screen a little too slowly. I didn't think this was really that big of a deal, but there is an option to turn it off if you want. And you can turn off the stylized fonts if you think they're too hard to read or prefer something plainer. The rest of the game looks really good too. Characters and environments are neat and colorful with believable animations and expressions. The visual design is inspired and based off of certain types of illustrations from around the time period that's being portrayed. And when you move between areas or zoom out to view the glossary, you're shown the environments and characters as if they're actually illustrations in an old manuscript, which I thought was really cool. And there are some nice, subtle details like how certain characters are drawn using different art styles to correspond with their age or where they're from. And facial expressions are actually done in 3D to make them appear more realistic, but they still blend perfectly with the rest of the 2D design. Everything has this tidy, hand-drawn look to it, and it's just a flat-out amazing art design. If history textbooks and schools look this good, the world might be filled with historians. Pentiment's soundtrack isn't used a whole lot. It's saved mainly to emphasize important moments in the story, which I thought was done effectively. You hear subtle ambient sounds most of the time, so when this gets interrupted by chilling choir music or one of the instrumental tracks, it makes these moments really stand out. It was performed and composed by a medieval ensemble group called Alchemy, and it sounds like it fits really well with the depicted time period. What you hear during the rest of the game are mostly nature sounds that give the town and abbey a relaxing quality, and it reminds you of how much more natural everything was back then. No cars honking their horns, lawnmowers, or annoying neighbors blasting music at 3 in the morning. It seems really cool to live more in tune with nature like this, until a storm hits and the place starts flooding. Near the beginning of the game, and once during the second act, you get to shape Andreas' past and personality by selecting various backgrounds. These impact the game by giving you special dialogue options, and certain decisions and outcomes are made easier or can only be obtained with a specific background. However, they won't alter the course of the main plot. You get to pick several of them for a single playthrough, and you'll see these background-related dialogue choices come up a lot during conversations. Of the ones I've used, my favorite was probably Rapscallion, because it lets you do and say some pretty wild stuff, like headbutt the town doctor, threaten monks, throw a sucker punch during a tavern brawl, and just be a general nuisance. Occultist was also pretty intriguing, and it seemed to make things easier during one of my investigations in Act 1. They all seem to offer something unique and useful, and they add to the game's replayability if you want to try out a different build. Pentiment's focus on dialogue and how you maneuver through its locations reminds me of point-and-click graphic adventure games, but without any difficult puzzles. You don't have to clamp a rubber duck to a clothesline or any weird stuff like that to move forward. Most of the minigames are basically the simplest tasks you could possibly think of. Snapping sticks, cutting cookies, or brushing bugs off yourself while hiding in the woods. So it seems like they're mostly just there to give the game some variety and let you take a short break from all the dialogue. What is a major obstacle though is time, and how you decide to spend it is vital to what information you'll have when your murder investigation concludes. Obviously no CSI van is going to roll up with a forensics team in the 1500s. In Act 1, a high-ranking clergy member called an Archdeacon gets sent to the Abbey to hear evidence and hand out judgment, and you won't be able to chase down every lead before he gets there. Pentiment's time system isn't like a timer ticking down that forces you to rush around from place to place. There is a clock, but it only moves forward when you engage in certain activities related to your investigation or do things like sleep or have a meal. You might decide to hang out with some of the town's women and listen to their gossip for clues, or follow a suspect as he goes about his day to see what he's really up to. Things like this push time forward, and there are more possible events like this available than there are time slots before the Archdeacon arrives, so you won't be able to take part in everything during a single playthrough, and you'll have to try and decide which leads are most likely to help you uncover the information you're looking for. Joining characters for meals works like this too. You have to decide who to eat with during meal times and hope that they'll divulge some useful information while you eat together. This time system lets Pentiment maintain a relatively slow pace while still managing to stress a sense of urgency. And since following leads comes at the cost of missing out on other leads, it raises the stakes of your decision making, which helped make stringing together related clues and discoveries feel exciting and satisfying, because I knew I had just made a series of relevant choices. But even then, the game never lets you shake the feeling that you're missing out on something, so there's always still an air of mystery hanging over the whole situation. As someone who usually tries to be thorough in games, especially narrative-driven games, you might think that I'd have a problem with a system like this. But I actually liked it a lot because of how it adds a cost to your choices. 
and it really just made me want to play the game again to make different decisions and go after different leads. However, Pentiment does allow you to be thorough in other ways during a single playthrough. There are lots of conversations you can have with NPCs that don't move time forward at all, and sometimes they'll help you out by giving you important clues and hints. And sometimes they won't. Important decision making isn't just limited to how you spend your time. The type of responses you give during dialogue can affect your disposition with characters, which sometimes factors into persuasion checks that, when successful, can reveal important information. Some of these get pretty challenging, and initially I got a little frustrated whenever I failed one. But I learned that you don't have to pass all of them or even discover all of the evidence against a suspect to sway the Archdeacon. And even if you do learn everything there is to know about a suspect, it's never really enough to completely convince you of their guilt. The game intentionally casts doubt on all of the suspects, which makes deciding who to blame a pretty tough decision. Since you can't be 100% sure, there are other factors you might want to consider. Maybe there's a character you think could be guilty, but if so, they had a pretty good reason for what they did. Or maybe there's someone you think is innocent, but you've discovered something else bad about them that you think deserves punishment. Or maybe there's someone who just pisses you off and you wouldn't mind them not having a head. It's definitely not a cut and dry process of following a linear set of clues and then learning the truth. You really have to think about your decisions and then live with the consequences of your choices in the next act. Pentiment has excellent writing. Like other mediums of historical fiction, it lets you experience the setting through the lives of believable characters that you get to know over the course of the game, which gives you a different kind of insight about the period than what you'd probably get from a textbook or a documentary. You're given a more upfront and personal view of some of the issues that people during that era faced, like how the church and nobility mistreat peasants by taxing them heavily, overworking them, and preventing them from gathering the resources necessary to their well-being. There's so much detail put into conversations with how the characters feel about these problems, or with whatever else they have going on in their lives, that it really pulls you in and turns the game into this incredibly immersive experience that made me feel like I had a real connection with the town. The story seems to focus more on the community of Tassing and Kirsu Abbey as a whole rather than any individual characters. You do learn more about Andreas through dream sequences, and he definitely faces some adversity, but the changes to the community over time and the challenges they face had more of an arc than any personal struggle. The game does have a serious tone in some regards, but there's also a lot of humor too, which you can increase by picking certain dialogue choices. And if you want to vent some frustration about the church, you can repeatedly badmouth the abbot, sometimes right to his face. Err. Each of the game's three acts has an investigation that's central to the main plot, but eventually other conflicts start to take the forefront, which unfold in a more linear fashion. Andreas starts discovering mysterious notes that indicate that a sinister thread puller is working behind the scenes to manipulate people into committing the crimes that he's been investigating. And the harsh restrictions imposed on the peasants reaches a boiling point during the second act, when the idea of a rebellion starts spreading through the community. The main plot and the investigations did a good job at pulling me along, and I really liked talking to everyone in each new act, to see what had changed during the years that had gone by and how some of my choices helped shape the town. There are some really significant changes in Act 3, so much so that it almost feels like a fresh start. I can't really say much without giving away spoilers, but I should mention that it's my favorite part of the game, mainly because of how much new stuff there is to check out, and it seemed to have a slightly calmer, more relaxed atmosphere than the previous acts. At the end of the game, the identity of the secret thread puller antagonist ended up being pretty predictable, but their motive was able to catch me a little more off guard, and it tied everything together in a way that made sense and added the closure necessary to make it feel like a satisfying ending, so I wasn't disappointed with how things played out. Before I played Pentiment, I thought that it sounded like the kind of game that I would like, and it still ended up exceeding every expectation I had. It really is a great game. The unique art style, fantastic writing, and interesting setting make it a game that I think deserves a spot in the top tier of narrative adventure games. I have an interest in history, but I wasn't very familiar with Germany in the early modern period. Thankfully, you don't need prior knowledge about this to understand and appreciate the game. Every time you jump into a fantasy or sci-fi game, you learn new things about their worlds, and good historical fiction like this works the same way. Another great thing about Pentiment is its price. It costs just $20, and it's on sale on Steam for the next few days. A single playthrough lasts between 15 to 25 hours, but with how much replay value it has to try out different choices and outcomes, you could easily double or triple that. 